it is very hard to know what to say in terms of coverage or reportage because this is unprecedented. The scale of this catastrophe is absolutely unbelievable. And it is, again, important to remember that not that long ago, i.e. a month, all of the people responsible for inflicting these harms upon our country were cheering Liz Truss to the rafters, the Daily Mail. And you have to check the dates sometimes. September the 24th, 2022. I'd remind you that the date today is the 17th of October, so not even a month ago. At last, a true Tory budget. And then uh, on September the 26th, two days later, Quasi's boost for families. These newspapers that turned you against high court judges that sought to persuade you that decent politicians had no place in our democratic structures have turned in three weeks from cheering it to the rafters to describing it as almost certainly the death knell for Liz Truss's premiership. At last, a true Tory budget. You have here a man called Mark Littlewood, who is the head of that bizarre organisation, the Institute of Economic Affairs, that is officially an educational charity and yet refuses to reveal who funds it and finds itself invited onto more programmes than uh, Stacey Solomon, if you were to keep a rough tally of who's popping up on the telly and the radio. He said just uh, less than a month ago, I'm extremely encouraged by what I've heard. Asked to give that mini budget marks out of ten, he gave it nine. How long before he pops up on your telly again or indeed on your radio. Nigel Farage, you remember him, the fellow with the Fisher-Price binoculars who goes down to Dover to rub his thighs at the sight of desperate people steaming into the country on flimsy dinghies. He tweeted, today was the best Conservative budget since 1986. I think he meant 1988, but intelligence, knowledge and indeed... uh, Consistency have never been his strong points. Uh, a, a chap called Julian Jessup, an economist for Brexit, another denizen of the so-called Institute of Economic Affairs. The initial reaction from most economic commentators and in the financial market has been a loud boo. There are some things I would have done differently, but the overall strategy is sound and sentiment should recover as the economic benefits become clearer. These people are Doolally, Gerard Lyons, another economist for Brexit, who reportedly um, was someone that Liz Truss valued the council of. This was a serious statement by the Chancellor. He not only reaffirmed his desire for a pro-growth policy agenda, but highlighted the focus on the supply side and on boosting investment. This is key to raising trend growth. It was necessary to reverse the corporation tax increase. They're reversing the reverse of the corporation tax increase. That's already been announced. Um, And the national insurance tax rise, both of which were negative for growth. These measures were already discounted and account for the bulk of the fiscal easing announced today as following figures show. Can you be more wrong than these people? And then, I'm afraid the man who, if there were a crown to be awarded for abject public idiocy, this fella would probably get it, although I've said it before and I'll say it again, he's only the second stupidest person ever to have edited City AM newspaper. Alistair Heath, also in The Telegraph. Sit down for this bit. This was on the 23rd of September of this year. I'd remind you again, it's not even the 23rd of October yet. It's, it's, it's just under a week away. This was the best budget I have ever heard a British Chancellor deliver by a massive margin. This man gets paid for his opinions, just like I do. He gets paid for his analysis of the news, just like I do. He gets paid to tell you the information that he thinks you need in order to make informed decisions. The tax cuts were so huge and bold, the language so extraordinary, that at times, listening to Kwasi Kwarteng, I had to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming, that I hadn't been transported to a distant land that actually believed in the economics of Milton Friedman and Hayek. This man still gets paid for his opinions. Still going to be drawing a cheque from the Daily Telegraph. I don't think we've finished yet. I think we've got a few more. You remember Lord Frost, the man who negotiated that Brexit withdrawal and then sought to disown it before the ink was even dry. He wrote, what an excellent statement from Kwasi Kwarteng. Proper tax cuts, reforms in the pipeline on infrastructure and enterprise, a focus on growth and improving our economy's productive capacity and all delivered with huge intellectual confidence. These people were watching the same events that you were watching, that we were watching together. They were crunching the same numbers. They were listening to the same noise and they concluded that black was white. 
that up was down, that the moon was made of cheese, that unicorns had finally arrived. They concluded that reality didn't matter because what they wanted to see was so overarching and so profoundly believed in that the strength of their convictions and their ludicrous cultish beliefs could somehow redraw the rules of reality itself. By insisting that something was true when it obviously wasn't, they could make it true. By denigrating and insulting and abusing those of us who've spent years quietly pointing towards reality, quietly insisting that light is better than dark, quietly explaining why these people were talking undiluted bilge on a highly paid and daily basis. They were vile to us and now all of their chickens have come home to roost almost at exactly the same time and almost by poetic coincidence just as Brexit begins finally to completely fall apart in real time and full public view so Donald Trump's utter depravity the seditious nature of his conduct in the run-up to January the 6th is becoming undeniable and crystal clear in America where thankfully the determination to cling to the carcass of corruption appears to be much more popular than it is here. Nobody, as far as I can tell, is clinging to the carcass of Liz Truss's premiership. And of course, some people will seek to separate it from the inevitability of recent events lying very much in the shadow of Brexit. But the idea of the Conservative Party as being responsible, as being trustworthy, as being uh, fiscally sound, as having the first idea what they were talking about has been exploded for a generation. So why don't I feel happier? Because I live here and I love this country and I never want to live anywhere else. I never have wanted to live anywhere else and I hate what I see. And the, the shallow schadenfreude of vindication, the small frisson of delight perhaps that you feel when you see some of the people responsible for inflicting this upon us all recognise their folly or at least acknowledge their mistakes, doesn't fix anything. It doesn't undo anything. It doesn't matter how many times you can scream, I told you so, from the top of the highest mountain in the country. It doesn't undo the damage that's been done. And I can't think of a better distillation of the last six years than the fact that today, a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer will seek to restore a modicum of stability to the United Kingdom's economic situation by completely dismantling and disowning policies announced by his own government less than four weeks ago. Pause and think. This is not normal. This is what happens when the ruling class is permitted largely by a supine and sycophantic media and a gaslit population to detach itself from observable and objective reality, to abandon truth, to denigrate <sighs> evidence. This is what happens. You prioritise belief over fact. You prioritise opinion over expertise, you prioritise demagoguery over evidence, this is where you end up, with somebody standing up full of vim and vigour, full of confidence. You just heard my recollections of those cheerleaders describing it as being intellectually incredible and uh, confident. All of these people, all of these vampires who sucked the blood from the body politic of Britain over the last six years, cheered this aberration to the rafters. They'd have carried Kwasi Kwarteng through the streets on their shoulders that weekend, even as the pound had a fit of the vapours. They claimed it would soon pass. But it doesn't, because they have rendered us small. They have rendered us less relevant than we have ever been before. And they have done it on the promise that it would make us stronger, that it would make us great again. They've withdrawn us from a massive global economic block, which leaves us absolutely blowing in the wind of market forces while claiming that they were taking back control. They have sacrificed everything. They've bet the house on a promise of growth while still being beset by senior members within their own ranks who are diametrically, psychologically, pathologically opposed to immigration. So we're going to have growth while we reduce the number of workers that can come into the country. They've bet the house on a xenophobic, jingoistic fever dream. And they've lost a lot. 